Hello, Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this virtual event from Majors and Quinn. My name is Steph. I am a bookseller and events associate here at the bookstore. For those who are unfamiliar, uh, Majors and Quinn is an independent bookstore in Uptown Minneapolis. Um, if it's your first time at one of our events, welcome. We're so happy to have you. And if you're returning for a second or third or however many virtual event, welcome back. We so appreciate your support. You guys are really the only reason that we are able to have these events and talk to wonderful people like Rebecca and Chris. I am so excited for the program this evening. Um, Rebecca is here to talk about her new book, A Thousand Ways to Pay Attention. If you're interested in purchasing the book, uh, you can head to our website, majorsandquinn.com. Uh, or give us a call. I will be putting both the link and our phone number in the comments so you guys can have easy access to that information. Uh, and speaking of the comments, please um, say hi, tell us where you are tuning in from. Um, and if you have any questions at any point in time throughout the event, um, please put them in the chat. We will have time for a quick 15 minute Q&A um, at the end. Um, so Anything you want to ask, just put it down there and we'll get to as many as we can. And with that out of the way, I will introduce our two lovely authors and I will get out of your hair. Um, Rebecca Schiller is a co-founder and trustee of the human rights organization Birthrights and a regular contributor to The Guardian. She is also the author of Your No Guilt Pregnancy Plan and the children's book Amazing Activists Who Are Changing Our World. On their small homestead in the English countryside, Rebecca and her family raise a motley crew of goats, geese, ducks, and chickens, and grow vegetables, fruit, and flowers to restore wildlife to the land. She lives in Kent, UK. And Chris Martin is this very moment endeavoring to become himself, a some many and tilted thinking animal who sways, hags, loves, trees, lights, listens, and arrives. He is a poet who teaches and learns in mutual measure, as the connective hub of unrestricted interest slash tilt and the curator of Multiverse, a series of neurodivergent writing from Milkweed Editions. His most recent book of poems is Things to Do in Hell and his first book of nonfiction, May Tomorrow Be Awake on Poetry, Autism and Our Neurodiverse Future will be published by Harper One in August of 2022. He lives on the edge of Bremakashka in Minneapolis among the mulberries with Mary Austin Speaker and their two bewildering creatures. With that, I will hand it off to you guys. Thanks so much. Thank okay, you. So. Chris, I think I need to improve my um, my biography. <laughs> I love yours. Um, I, I'm going to start. Thank, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to start with a brief reading from um, A Thousand Ways to Pay Attention. Excuse all my post-it notes, but um, they're very on brand, um, as uh, if you do have a copy of the book, you will discover that, that post-it notes feature quite heavily in my life and in the book itself. Um, the passage I'm gonna read is from the, uh, towards the end of the book, um, actually. Um, and it's after a period, a really difficult period where I've been trying to um, become somebody else, do what I've been told, shut down in lots of different ways. And I've just thrown all of that off um, and am trying to um, exist in a truer way. Um, and it's a time of also reconnecting with my uh, homestead, my small holding, and with some of the people, some of the women of the small holdings past who have um, acted as way markers and guides um, in a blurry space between the present and back then, here and there. Um, so yeah, I'll start. There is still work to be done. So I slip out the back door, heading to the hen house through land that is luminous despite the gray day. My June garden is emerging from December's bog and there's a shimmer of energy around the place. As the wind ruffles the field maple's bare branches and a carrion crow shouts above us, I ditch the chores and go to the old oak instead. It has been too long since I found a fissure, a way through 
but I have opened the egg box and with that closed the messy chapters of my life and readied for something clean, fresh, distinct and unsullied. My eye is open and so is the oaks. And I looked to that tree, asking it for something minuscule on which to lean and open a breach onto a new territory. With the help of the last Christmas magic in the air, I find it in sound. There is a cacophony of voices to tune into. Victor's old fashioned phone already ringing, geese honking, a faraway tractor, the scratch of a hundred year old hoe, Harry's pig squealing. Mary steps on the drover's path, Joan's slower pace to the coops and the hum of the battery chicken farm down the road. Under all this, I hear the sound of the ancient forest and a baby crying to be fed. I exert more leverage and help these cries of many yesterdays become a roundness of skin and milk dribble tied to his mother's back. The woman is hard at work on this land, bending carefully so as not to tip the baby out, but ignoring its wails so she can finish clearing the far too heavy rocks and pull the ivy that's finally loose enough to free. This is the moment that the forest becomes a clearing. There is pain in the trees, a keening of branches, a root stamping of grief and protest as the wind rubs the forest against itself. Light breaks through the still tiny hole in the canopy. A pile of logs, a makeshift shelter, a fire smouldering and pigs rooting in the distance. We are in one of the forest dens, the nomad summer grazing place now becoming a permanent set settlement because of her. It is her I am most interested in, always her. Stubborn, relentless, awful, brave. Sweat run da runs down the woman's neck and it drops cool against my own skin as she finally sits on a stump next to a vast and newly felled trunk. Her face changes as she brings the baby round to her, hard becoming not soft but flexible. As they smile at each other and he latches on, little sucks at first, and then tiny pin-like fizzes of milk let down in her breasts, and he gulps, then swallows. For now, the small holding's first settler just sits and sways the baby to sleep, as she always has, as she always will. She has always been here, she will always be here. She's the one to credit, she's the one to blame. This woman is the settler, the invader, the oppressor, the destroyer of all things. She is the nomad who stayed, the solution, the protector, the bringer to life, the peasant, the queen. I search for her shadow, a walk in her footsteps, a tremble in her wake, I kiss her ankles, I tread on her toes. Thanks very much. That was so beautiful. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, I love how in that passage, and I think in the book, um, kind of writ large, you do such a deft job of taking like multiplicity and contradiction and instead of those being a problem uh, or a, a, a problem in a negative sense, they become a generative problem, uh, something that can open things up. Um, yeah, and I'm so interested in how that um, mirrors, but also refuses the framework of diagnosis. <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's that. I think one of the interesting things about writing a book like this, which in many ways was written in real time <laughs> um, and with not much um, opportunity to have digested over many years and fixed things down but really being very responsive to things as they happened and evolved um and so 
it's a, there are a series of revelations and realizations in the book where I think as a writer and as a person that I've kind of I've, I'm there I've mm -hmm. worked out what the end of the book is what the end of the story is what the eventually what the diagnosis is I I receive multiple diagnoses and eventually um an ADHD diagnosis but even that is something then that refuses to be fixed and I even though I'm desperate to fix it down immediately, as soon as it's something that's fixed, I start to <laughs> pull it apart and disrupt it. Um, and I think in that there is something of the need to move and create space that um, nomad figure who features in the book and, and who I, I read a little about there, um, the realization that, that's perhaps who who I really am, somebody who craves and that movement and is best with a changing horizon um, and has I have my eyes on the on the big picture. And so in order to exist in a a permanent settlement, I have to be creating my own changing horizon. And I, I think that urge to understand and fix things down while also then scatter them into many many fragments and let the let, let that refract a whole load of light and loads of different directions is 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 to do with 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 that need to move mm -hmm. and and be nimble and flexible um yeah absolutely and i think that that's another thing that i love about the book is that on one hand you have this kind of false solution at the beginning of the book which is like property right mm -hmm. if i can have the right kind of property <laughs> and maybe that is like a you know an echo of like the the properties that we're made of or whatever like if i can find that right property then i will be okay or i will mm -hmm. be fixed um and the ways in which to to know that there's no fixing it either by like finding a solution or fixing it in space that like it's going to move it's going to change um yeah i have a um a friend named uh aman bukela this is her book of poems uh her chat book of poems truth omg and uh to describe herself, she wrote, I'm a moving nomad, thinker, thoroughly fracking, fossilized ideas, extracting the essence of truth. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, and she also often writes about trust modes of trespass. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that these ways in which um, the book is able to pull out these necessary trespasses both of like private property, but also of time, you know, trespasses of um, identity and uh, ancestry. I mean, I think that I'm so moved by the idea that there could be a way of belonging to place that wasn't fixed, that was nomadic. Yeah. Yeah, that that it, it's it's so there are so many layers to it and and I ended up writing quite a lot about and, and thinking quite a lot about physics, which I still don't understand. Um, so <laughs> nobody test me. No yeah. physics questions, please. Um but when I started working on this um, North American edition, which is quite a dramatic reimagining of a of a, of the British version, my editor said, um, "What if this is a book about time?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, it's about time. Great, of course, it's about time." Um, and then the more I thought and wrote about time, the more I ended up writing about space. And that's when I started looking at space time simply because those were the two words. Yeah. That was where the two words occurred together. And 
I realized that in a sort of neurodivergence as a problem context, time is of course seen as the thing that um, an ADHD person has a big problem with. And it's something that I have felt, you know, a struggle mm -hmm. with time. But the more I thought about what that's made of, the more it felt like it was actually made of, of space and place mm -hmm. rather than time. So when I have too many things in my diary, um, it's not that I don't have the time to do them. It's that I feel constrained. There is not enough space in between mm -hmm. so that if something else happens if there's an emergency if i need you know if i'm really tired if i get ill if a you know goat decides to have kids you know yeah. i need the space in between those things and i also need the space to sort of move out personally between them and explore and i think when i think about look places as somewhere to live or somewhere to be that restriction of of being in one place i am also excited by the idea of being free of that by feeling the layers of a place in time in the people who are there and also in the connections that, you know, I, I spend quite a lot of time thinking and then writing about ways I could get to other places and people and languages while just being here. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that sort of vision of all of those channels, almost like the brain, you know, synapses going is something that really, genuinely helps me um, yeah. when I feel, you know, that claustrophobia or constraint. Totally. Well, and I, yeah, those layers seem so important. Do they, is the term placemaking a thing in the UK? If it is, yeah. it is, uh, what, it is a term that I haven't, I'm not literary enough to know. But... Here, <laughs> here, yeah, here in like certain cultural and academic circles, this yeah. idea of placemaking is like very um, popular right now, yeah. or at least becoming so. And the idea of like, when you engage with a place, it's not just on the surface, but you want to um, uncover the historical layers, like what to, to imagine that you just like arrive at a place and it's just the way it is and it couldn't be otherwise um, is to have this really superficial relationship with it. Whereas if you, you know, dig into the history of that place, you realize like, oh, there are so many factors, political, historical, um, you know, racial that, uh, have shaped the way this place is and appears um and it's such a beautiful way of like of that place staying vital or it's um it's relationship to you staying vital you know it's kind of like i don't know if you've ever heard that uh i think it was margaret mead i might get this wrong but who said like everyone has three marriages sometimes they're to the same person <laughs> And I could see that about place too, right? Yeah. Like you can't, if you don't renew your relationship with place and dig further into it, then you might have to break up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I think also that kind of, that it, the, the need to, which is something that I feel quite, you know, another, compulsion is not to not to always take you know what's the easy way and what's the hard way but but yeah. to to be reckoning with the difficult things as well yeah. you know culturally um we I, you know we've been very good at <laughs> ignoring the layers of place yeah and arriving and a acting as if uh nothing and no one has ever existed before and um it's 
it feels essential to 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 not do that but of course in an environmental context um you know in a um racial justice context in looking at sort of post-colonial um world what looking looking at the layers isn't necessarily just connecting with beautiful things right um and um and so that that need and desire to do something that feels right while also knowing that it is difficult mm -hmm. and, and big um is is something you started by asking about that kind of that contradiction you know yeah. as uh, and and i think as a you know i describe quite a lot that feeling of being you know pulled in pulled in two directions and the, the sort of scary black hole opening up and i think in lots of ways the book is an attempt to find a way for that space to open up and it not be not be the scary black hole yeah and i i find this to be a hallmark of neurodivergence that is really um moves across so many different um identities and diagnoses that um there is this desire a deep desire for authenticity and um and an authentic relationship to um to place to truth to other people that the the kind of the small talk of the world just won't do yeah. and that if we can find ways to unravel like greater truths um like that's what makes us feel a sense of belonging, especially if we can do it with other people. Um, yeah, I was talking to an autism therapist a couple of years ago and uh, and one of the, at some point we had a conversation about kind of what area of the map I might be said to exist in. And she's mm -hmm. like, I see this very distinctly that there are certain people who, feel this just unquenchable urge to unravel the world through language mm -hmm. and which is like oh man i wish that was on uh, like on in the dsm for the oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's like that would feel like so welcoming like yes where who are, where are the rest of my people <laughs> <laughs> well i can i can yeah. i join <laughs> already there um, i think that sort of that finding um, finding a, finding definitions that are made when when um, Steph read your biography at the beginning, mm -hmm. it, it occurred to me that I, I've never I've never done anything other than you know write the four sentences you have to write in the way that you have right. to write it, um, and just that realization that of course I could write it differently. I mean, I'm a writer. <laughs> Never occurred to me. And so those moments where it's like, oh, I get to, I get to make, I get to make a category <laughs> if, I, if I need one. Um, right. These permissions. And yeah. I think that that's something that, um, and I think this is direly lacking when it comes to ADHD community, right? Is that there, the permissions and the belonging around those kind of things just don't so rarely exist. And I think people are starting to build those things. Um, but, you know, I like the only reason I was able to make my way towards that kind of bio was because of uh, friends who are neuro neurodivergent and disabled who wrote amazing bios that were like, wait, we can yeah. do that? Like, you know, you, I read it and I was like that. Like, that's yeah. what I want. How on earth didn't I know that that was a, okay, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's sort of, sometimes I think we shouldn't, you know, I think, why, why do I need, why do I need permission? Why do I need someone to show me the way? Why didn't I, you know, I've got an yeah. imagination. Why didn't I think of that? But actually, I think the process of like personal resistance and breaking out is fairly consuming and and, <laughs> and tiring and um yeah. it's often happening subconsciously mm -hmm. so i i kind of have to try and remember that like if if there's quite a few things that i haven't 
remembered yet or noticed that that maybe that's maybe that's okay well um, and i think for people who who have the privilege on one hand of masking and of being able to code switch into neurotypical spaces that the longer you do that the more conditioned you are the more somatically trained you are to occupy those kind of spaces and so the breaking out can be a really long process and 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 all of a sudden like yeah. you know what was unthinkable to you like a year ago is all of a sudden unthinkable in the opposite direction you know yeah. because you can make such leaps but they don't yeah it doesn't always happen all at once <laughs> no it, it definitely feels like a, a a slowly slowly process i i did a um a talk with Catherine May, um, yeah. an Instagram talk a, a couple of weeks ago, and she was talking about parties and about how you know people will invite her to parties, but she's like, "But it's great, invite me, out, but I don't, I won't go because I don't like parties." And during the conversation, I was like, "Oh, do I like parties? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea if I like parties. Yeah. Um, I thought I liked parties, <laughs> but." It's been a while since I've been to one, partly because of the pandemic. Yeah. But also I haven't been to one since um, I realized I was neurodivergent and since I started tuning into all of the sensory issues that I have that I've not uh, just ignored. Yeah. I wonder if maybe I don't like parties, yeah. but I have no idea. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> There, I mean, I, I remember listening to a podcast with Catherine um, and she described a particular scene of being at a dinner and having it be very sensory overwhelming and her sitting there kind of like, is this not like killing anyone else? Yeah. And I had just had that experience and it was so helpful to mm -hmm. have someone articulate that. Um, but I also, I do love parties. And I think partially it's because other people start acting neurodivergent if they've had a couple drinks. Of them. <laughs> and so as long as we can get to that point, I think that's why my favorite point was always the end of the night. Like yeah. I kind of wanted to go straight there to when people were just like totally opening up and, you know, sometimes it was outrageous and sometimes they were falling apart, but at least it was like, oh, at least you're like, just speaking, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're now speaking the same language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will report back when I go okay. to a party, whether it turns out I like them or not. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the book, I think, is the ways in which you've created a kind of party, and it's, sometimes it's a scary party, but uh, this kind of company with... Um, these women throughout time with these amazing hags and nomads. Um, and I wonder, and of course we both have families and families are a really complicated situation, especially for people who feel a lot um, and who probably have kids that feel a lot. And, you know, there's such a, a kind of, intense feedback loop that can be created there but um i wonder having you know finished the book a while ago how those how that company with these women of the past and with this idea of a kind of kindred hagdom how that's like holding up and changing for you I, it's it's been really interesting how profoundly the missing women who, you know, I come into a relationship with during the, the process of researching and writing the book have have become important to me. Yeah. Um, so last year, kind of as I was writing the 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 um, North American edition, um, I had another kind of a horrible mental health episode mm. partly just that moment when you take off the mask yeah. <laughs> and then you have to look at all the stuff that you've spent your whole life thinking was terrible and shameful and there it is 
<laughs> and and um and and I had a I had a big trauma response to it. I had to yeah. I had to go away from home. I could, I couldn't be at home, and it was it was pretty difficult. Um, and so I started having some um EMDR trauma therapy. Mm-hmm. An amazing therapist who um is super imaginative. And one of the things that we did in that was think of a a place and think of some figures who represent different things yeah. and of course i realized as soon as she said that that i knew who this cast of characters was yeah so they've become really central to my um recovery from this um you know huge trauma response that i had and yeah. so now if i'm in the kind of situations that I describe in the book where I completely unravel. Yeah. The people who are doing the things that I never learned to do for me, like soothing myself. Yeah. That's um that's Joan Newman. Mm-hmm. Um, that's Agnes. Yeah. You know, they're actually there. And it has a a big um impact on my sort of physiological response yeah if I do um and and because of the kind of therapy I've had um I don't just have to try really hard it's actually been kind of um EMDR is a a kind of magical um because it does some of the hard work for you um so it's it's my my brain wants to wants to summon the mark in those situations and that's um that feels incredible to be being really helped by these real women from the past but also to know that they are they are parts of me as well you know totally. um, yeah uh, that's that's how i came to the some many in the bio is i was writing something where i was going to refer to myself as a someone and all of a sudden in the context of what i was writing the one seemed so paltry so insufficient and it just didn't even make sense. Um, and so it was like, well, what, what else is there? It's, it's like, what about a some mini? Um, and I think that uh, there's something that is so supportive about that. There's something that's so freeing about that. I mean, to be the individual that a kind of, you know, to be frank, like white supremacist capitalist society wants and needs you to be Mm. um is the perfect vehicle for that kind of shame and that kind of masking and that kind of conditioning Mm. so that to step outside of it you need more than what you've taught is yourself right you need like to discover those resources and it's like such a an echo of what you're saying about the play of land and place right there's so many layers within ourselves that are just totally untapped these resources these amazing resources um and that that's one of the things i love about what happens after the diagnosis right because this diagnosis is like it can be really relieving right it can explain a lot from the past but it's not going to help you necessarily like step into the future alone right those letters just can't do it um nor can like the adderall or whatever else right all this can help but you realize oh i have to do a a lot more work actually to Mm -hmm. like discover what is specific to me yeah yeah i i think i think it's again that sort of moving target that that a, a belief like like i believe the, the the right property you know the the right job yeah right haircut sometimes <laughs> yeah. um and 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 the diagnosis there it is fixed down and and of course it it very very much isn't um and and i i love the idea of some some many that's just wonderful um do you also have a do you know some of the many's? Are they- well, for me, what's what was such a treat about reading your book, it was about the same time where I'd had this really um, profound experience where I 
I have a good friend who I consider a, a kind of disability doula who um, makes um, these like uh, bath rituals. Uh, my wife got me one. And then, like part of it is like you have a question that you bring, right? And then uh, within the bath, like you see if like the, the, the answer comes to you um, and I had been, I'd been just going through a difficult time with some friends who were kind of overstepping and wanting to me to do things that would serve their purposes, but they weren't being very thoughtful or careful about mine. Um, and I had been able to hold a boundary, but it, it was, I was worried and frustrated and a little angry. And um, the thing that came to me was, uh, like out of nowhere was just like, be the tree you already are. And it was so interesting. And then I was like able to go back and think about all the ways I have talked about myself as a tree in the past. Um, and like, see like, oh, you like were kind of cluing in all along. And then to have that coincide with learning more about my own ancestry and thinking about um, Irish and Gaelic relationships to trees and um, being able to understand like, so, okay, what's a day where I need to be the oak and what's a day where I need to be the hawthorn. And like, for me, that's been extremely helpful. I think it's probably very similar to, to your Agnes and Joanne. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can, this instantly makes me want to go and research more about trees and, and Ireland as well, because I um, possibly unsurprisingly, I'm also uh, <laughs> uh, a, a chip off the old Irish block. Um, yeah. And I, I think that um, the, the, those things that you didn't know you knew all along, that, that then when something is revealed, like, you know, yeah. come into you, you know, be the tree. Um, and I, I think there are so many things that I have, I, I came across and, and believe for a moment were sort of revelations, were new information. And then as I learned more, it was very clear that they, they had persisted, not just through my life, but these were often things, sometimes they were, I was remembering things I'd never known. Mm -hmm. so, the, the feeling of um I, I write about it with sowing seeds for the first time saving yeah. seeds mm -hmm. and then sowing the seeds and it felt like something the the, the movement the hand movement yeah. and I now realize that I'm very I process through touch mm. um, I hadn't ever realized that until, until the last year but so doing this movement for the first time of working the seeds out of the seed pod yeah it was familiar yeah i'd never done it before but it was familiar it, it felt like something i absolutely knew how to do and had done had done before and when last summer i was away in wales driving along the road and suddenly became aware of something i couldn't i couldn't have seen but there when i parked up the hill was a sheep stuck between the fence and the yeah that nomad you know the, the nomad oh. doing it's always checking for the sheep yeah you know and and, and that's i've never kept sheep um it, yeah. but it, those things that that are sort of cellular yeah um, you know and and the, the 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 memory particularly for me through through sensory stuff um mm -hmm. it, it's very yeah it's very striking and i and i wonder about how much of the relationship with with trees and nature is comes from that place uh, the, absolutely the well and i think that I, yeah that i think it there i mean there's so many different ways and i love them all to talk about this but um one way that strikes me, I just finished rereading Braiding Sweetgrass mm -hmm. uh, by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And um, I, you know, this question of how might we grow indigenous to place? How might we grow indigenous to land? Um, no, you know, with the acknowledgement that 
in everyone's ancestry, they were indigenous at some point to some land. Um, and that, uh, and I think that the, you know, the, this, the solution that wasn't quite the solution of the small holding, right? It in some ways was a pathway towards solution because you spent so much real, attentive, engaged time in relationship with both the land and with all of these like, you know, plant relatives and animal relatives in the more than human world. And it's, I, I mean, I think anyone who's thought about it very much understands that all of our most uh, central metaphors as a species come from those relationships, right? That's where we first develop those metaphors. And so as we re-engage uh, with the land and with the more than human world, we discover all of this amazing metaphorical language and understanding and perspective that was there all along, right? And that exists within us. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the, the, it's, you, you have to, have a reason to in, engage with it now. You know, yeah. there has to be a, a framework. And I think one of the realizations I've been having is that I, I will always have 17 different reasons why I'm doing something and yeah. a very, a plan that I could explain. Yeah. But the real reason why I'm doing something, I probably don't know yet. Mm, yeah. And I think this sort of part of that is simply about moving very fast and, and realizing how fast I move through time. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and, and suddenly being able to listen to podcasts because I've discovered you can listen to them twice as fast on double speed and then I can hear them. That's so interesting. I thought I, I, thought I couldn't catch it. Mm -hmm. But it was that I got bored between in the gaps between the words. You yeah. know? It was, and and now that I listen to them at, at, at twice the speed, and I, I think the trusting that the reason, if you have a strong intuitive pull to something, mm -hmm. the trusting of that, yeah. rather than having to build a very um, capitalist friendly right. argument for doing it. Um, because actually I think one of the reasons that I moved here was because I knew I needed a framework through which I would have to go outside Yeah. because otherwise the animals would die and yeah. the plants would die. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, I, it might've been a bit easier on me if I'd realized what I was doing <laughs> and hadn't had to dress it up quite so much. So I think that, that intuitive intuition, you know, and that I would catch up intellectually with the reason why I was doing something. And I, mm -hmm. I, that's a hard thing to believe and trust in. Yeah, I feel like um, we'll move on to the Q and A's after this, but um, I, that's something that, um, that I think is so important about, one of the things I love about this book is that it, you're so open and vulnerable about the ways in which you're not an expert. And I think that for me, that's like so important to me to resist expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think I haven't known why that was for me until recently. And I think it does have to do with neurodivergence. And I think it does have to do with, um, avoiding the capture of a certain kind of like neurotypical and capitalist and in many ways misogynist um, mental framework that wants to have a certain kind of authority and pursues it uh, to the detriment of like of discovery and of like, you know, f of finding something. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, it's like a full stop, isn't it? That like the the a really big 
full stop to be an expert. Like, you know everything, you know, you're the authority um, and you've put the flag. <laughs> exactly. It's another way of fixing, right? You yeah. Fix the flag. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's, it's, I, I find that quite frightening. Um, yeah. the, the idea of doing that. Um, Me too. And other people, <laughs> and unfortunately, those people often find it very frightening, like this kind of conversation. Because yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, actually, this thing that you built your life around is maybe problematic. Maybe yeah. it doesn't have as much value as you like wanted it to have. And, and it does have in the world, unfortunately, you know. Yeah. But uh, we have some great questions. Um, so Pamela asks, um, how has your life changed since your diagnosis and as the world recovers from the pandemic? Wow, that is a big question. Big one, yeah. um, and I I think it's changed, I think my life has changed enormously since the diagnosis and the diagnosis being a kind of gateway yeah. rather than the reason um and probably the most the, the biggest shift over time has been from thinking of myself as as something to be worked out yeah. and fixed as accepting that i am a certain way and that the good things are in that and that is to be explored and that a lot of the difficulty was not inherent in the way my brain wanted to work it was in believing that that was bad and trying to cover it up and it not feeling acceptable and I, and just a, a sort of active process of noticing when I do that um so when I'm really busy Mm -hmm. And I'm on 15 planes of hyperfocus, which I am at the moment, a real sort of hyperfocus jag in various different directions. Yeah. I hear myself saying, you're doing too much, you need to rest more, you're going to burn out, this is, you know, you need to focus on one thing. And then now I recognize that, though, of course, there is, you know, there is some truth in some of that, that actually... I don't do resting the same way. Yeah. You know, it, that's not comfortable for me. I get something from this and that actually I, I couldn't, I can't put the things down because if I do, I just pick another 15 of them back up. Mm -hmm. And, and so trying to, trying to, to look at things in that way and notice, notice the, the w which voices are actually, you know, coming from that intuitive yeah. part. Um, and I, I think, I think it's been interesting to do that in conjunction with the pandemic. In some ways, it was, um, well, being a terrible thing to go through and being terrified for the suffering of others. Being able to retreat from the world was quite helpful. And in other ways, it, it it has been it has complicated and made things more difficult. Um, so yeah, I, I I I I'm still very much in it. I think <laughs> um, maybe maybe I'll write another book in a couple of years, and I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, that's one of the interesting things about writing a book like this, right? Is that like it's literally the language we use, right? You're the author. So it seems as if you have some authority over the subject matter and over your life and that it's, you're wrapping it up. Like you can get onto the stage and just kind of give people all the answers they need. And that's just not true. Um, and I think that, that, and that can be a very hard thing to kind of internalize, right? Is that like, <laughs> I don't have to show up here and know everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh and so I love um Elizabeth's question, which is about reading recommendations, because I feel like that's one of the things that's so helpful is to know that none of us have to be the exam exemplar of any particular like 
ideas around this and that there are so many other people writing exciting stuff right now that touches on this and that you know and that's really right at the heart of the neurodiversity movement is this idea like none of us are going to figure it out alone we need all of these perspectives all of these minds and that they will complement each other in these totally necessary ways yeah the the this is a a community and a subject that is could not lend itself more to multiplicity you yeah. know but it's also made of people who have often been you know constrained and told that their multiplicitous way of seeing things is wrong so that you know um there is a a tension and a shrugging off um but but it it is hugely exciting um i i would love to i would love to know your reading recommendation chris while i think of mine because <laughs> i I tend to forget all books I've ever read yeah. when anybody asks me. <laughs> I have so many and I like have a, like a little um, amazing stack over here. Uh, but although, although I'll share this one first, um, there's a, a book called Neuro, oops, yeah, it's like backwards, Neuroqueer Heresies, uh, Notes on the Neurodiversity Paradigm, Autistic mm -hmm. Empowerment and Post-Normal Possibilities. So Nick Walker is an amazing uh, scholar and writer and also runs Autonomous Press, which is um, an amazing um, neurodivergent publisher. Um, and I think it's it's an incredibly grounding book for terminology. Um, there were things where it's like, well, I know everything about the use of this word and it was like, no, actually you don't. Um, there's all these really interesting aspects that are worth going into. Um, in terms of two things that we just talked about, uh, there's um, Entangled Life, which people might not think of as a, a book about neurodiversity, but I actually think it is uh, in many ways. And so that idea of layers and like what's going on under the surface, like there's a lot going on under the surface. Um, and then to speak for the trees, um, which is uh, a book written by an Irish author who actually had like the privilege of growing up in um, in a community. Well, she was had the tragedy of being orphaned and then was raised by an entire community uh, around Waterford, I believe, um, where she was able to learn the old ways um, that were tied to the land and then became this really successful famous tree scientist um and so it also like half of it is her story and half of it is the um alphabet with all of the different trees and um kind of breakdown on like the, the uses the relationships around those trees yeah oh, wow i i feel like i need to read um you know I've, I've read entangled um entangled life but i i haven't i haven't read the other two so <laughs> i have to hope i can get them over here um i'm not in my room where the books are but i do somewhat randomly have um tanya hirschman's um very beautiful poetry book which is called and what if we were all allowed to disappear Ooh. um and it's published by Gillingwatt Press. And there's a, actually one of the um, epigraphs in A Thousand Ways is from there. And one of the things I really, it's also a book that is not explicitly about neurodivergence, but it's 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 a poetry collection about time and about, mm -hmm. um, it's inspired by the Large Hadron Collider in particle physics. But the, the, the pages, which I have read so much, they come out. Yeah. Um, some of them are tracing paper so it's literally layers oh awesome um, and the, the the poems emerge from longer text mm. and the book can be read um back to front so the more you read this the more is in it um and and i've read it again and again and again um and i love how layered it is and how complicated while appearing quite simple yeah. at first. 
Um, and I also, I think it's just come out in um, North America, Joanne Lindbergh's Letters to My Weird Sisters. Mm, I really want to read that, yeah. I it's read. really good. Um, I really haven't read anything that, um, the blend mm -hmm. of, memoir and investigation and the way that the book is set up as letters to um particular real women who um joanne recognizes some of her own um autistic traits and she's not not diagnosing them but she's she's communicating with them yeah. and it's deeply personal um and revelatory and political and fascinating and um, and really really gripping. So I I I'm, I don't have my copy to wave around, but it's letters to my weird sisters. And that's um, I've, and it's spelled the regular way weird. Yes, yes, yes right. spelled the regular way, and um, the author's name is Joanne Limburg. Awesome. Yeah, and we have Pamela also brings up Divergent Mind by Janara Nuremberg, which is a great. Um, also a kind of grounding text for ideas of sensitivity um, and the variations uh, of neurodivergence um, and the way they cross over with um, mad and disabled cultures in yeah. important ways. Um, I also wanna just throw a quick plug for, so this is the first book from the series that I run from Milkweed called Multiverse and it's uh, Hannah Emerson, mm -hmm. The Kissing of Kissing, and I think it's literally the best book of poems that exists. Um, and Hannah is a dear friend and a non-speaking autistic poet um, who lives in New York. Um, but I would definitely encourage everyone to go get that. Um, it's a beautiful cover as well. Yeah, my wife designed it. Oh, but <laughs> Keeping it in the family. Oh, yeah. She did a wonderful job. All right. Is there any final thoughts or ideas that anyone in the audience wants to ask or comment or for you, Rebecca? Um, it's just um, very wonderful and weird to be here in my um, Kent uh living room at one in the morning yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> uh talking to you um so far away and knowing that there are other people um you know around listening and watching and i think one of the most beautiful and unexpected things about writing the the book was that the layers mm -hmm. adding yeah because people share their stories and their responses and it it's those get woven in to to the book and the story mm -hmm. and that map i was talking about the synapses you know going here and there this you know this particular connection um is now part of that and i i think that makes it feel incredibly worthwhile and, and, and exciting. Um, and so I'm really grateful to, to you for, for talking to me and, and, and to everybody for, for their questions and, and for watching. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a quote that I, I use as an epigraph to the next thing, I'm, uh, my next book, but uh, from Merlin Sheldrake, that's nature is an event that never stops. <sighs> and I feel like every book is that way if if you let it um if you allow it to grow and 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 spread and you know make those mycelial or synaptic connections mm -hmm. all over the place um but yeah it was such a pleasure thank you so much thank all you. right thank you guys both um it has just been such a magical magical experience to be able to listen to you both discuss and talk so eye-opening and just it, it makes me hopeful for the world that we can build. So I just want to really extend my most deep gratitude to you both um, and to everyone who tuned in and who watched. Uh, I hope you all have a lovely night. Rebecca, thank
thank you so much for being up until 1 a.m. for us. It is such a pleasure. And if you're ever in the States, please come by and say hi. Thank you. Thanks very much. Of course. Have a nice night, everybody. Good night, everyone.